Hi everyone, welcome to the B++ podcast, uh, a podcast where we talk about, you know, the absolute latest in digital technologies, what's happening around the world in terms of innovation, where we speak to the leaders in the technology space. And uh, it's more relevant than ever now that we live in dystopian times in this uh, time of a pandemic where businesses are absolutely worried and they are scared. And at the same time, they are trying to innovate as quickly as possible. And today we have a very special guest all the way from Brisbane, Australia, or at least that's where she was the last time we spoke, Ali Lord. Ali, thank you so much for joining the B++ podcast. How are you doing? And tell us a bit more about yourself. Hi, Abby. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, so you are correct. I'm, I'm still in Brisbane. Um, I'll be going down to Sydney at the end of this month, providing no more restrictions. But as we know, that, that seems to change by the minute. Um, so I, I guess just to give a bit of background and introduction to myself, um, I'm the CEO of Headbox Australia, which is an event technology company. We were born uh, out of London um, and our founder um, started the company there five years ago. Um, and my story and how I've sort of come to, to where I'm today, I think is quite cool. Um, I actually was a Headbox client on the corporate side for three and a bit years. Um, and I, I, at the time, worked for a large media company doing their events and I, I needed to partner with somebody uh, to, to support me with that because my workload was growing uh, and I wasn't able to get any additional resource. Um, and Headbox came about and they, they were at that time very unknown uh, and what they were doing was very unknown which I think is actually what attracted me to them. I've always been fascinated by tech and whenever new players pop up I think that piques my interest. Um, and so I, I looked at their proposition and, and the team within it uh, and decided to partner with them. And that took us on a journey of three years of um, brilliant success as a partnership. And um, that then brought me to uh, end of 2019. And they said, would I be interested in launching Headbox in Australia, uh, mm -hmm. which has brought us forward to the today. Um, what's been thrown in the midst of that is COVID, a global pandemic. <laughs> um, so that, that's kind of, that's certainly presented its challenges, but I think going back to being first and foremost a tech company, if you can be agile in this space, uh, which we're fortunate and we have been able to, if you can be agile and pivot your product and, and change going, okay, well, what we plan for this year is completely wiped off the table um, and, and rethink your proposition for your clients, then you, you'll continue to come out of it. So that, that's kind of a, a snapshot on where I've come from and um, how I'm back in Australia after six years in London. Well, thank you so much. I mean, thanks for that lovely introduction. And I mean, I remember from our last conversation, you know, we were talking about uh, Headbox and just the business model in itself is like the perfect fit for a pandemic stricken world in a way, right? Where businesses are struggling and where, you know, live events and conferences and business travel has come to an absolute standstill. So uh, would you say there was a blessing in disguise in a way, or would you say uh, that, you know, you adapted very quickly, something that you just referred to as well, or was it always the plan to be uh, this uh, pretty amazing business model? I wouldn't say uh, that was always our plan. Um, and I, I certainly wouldn't be as bold to say that we welcomed the pandemic. Yeah. Uh, but I think going to, <laughs> yeah. I don't think nobody did. That. Nobody <laughs> did. Yeah. But I think going back to um, the agility of the company um, and when the, when the pandemic really hit London at uh, the beginning of March, our CEO in London made a very quick decision with the leadership team to, to look at our offering for clients. And in that stage, clients were just cancelling events left, right and centre. And, and in-person events were, is what we did. Um, you, you know, our, our strap line is human kind event technology. That's what we do. And there's humans play a big role in that. Mm. But very quickly, we recognised that this pandemic was going to be around for some time. It, it wasn't going away. Mm. We needed to thrive more so survive as a business. So what were we going to do to change? Mm. Um, we were, were fortunate that um, as, as part of our, our client base, we have a number of large companies um, on board that we do their uh, complete events agenda for. Um, and they still needed to engage with whether it be clients or, or colleagues or anything in, in that regard. So we looked at our product and said, okay, well, let, let's change to virtual. Because whilst it's still not that, you know, think a summer party, um, it's still not as fun. It's a nice touch point. 
Right. So by, by being able to change that and deliver that solution for clients, which mm -hmm. a lot of clients didn't even know about. When, when you talk to them about a virtual event in the, the early days, it was completely foreign to them. Now mm -hmm. it's becoming much more um, part of the normal lingo. Right. So how, how difficult was this transition? Because we speak with business owners. I, I remember at the you know, start of lockdowns and you know, one of our clients who we've had for more than 13 years and they are a massive uh, F&B company with presence across countries, they came to us and they said, well, we've been around for so many years, but we don't have an e-commerce presence because you know, why do you need e-commerce presence is food and beverage and they have thousands of outlets in 17, 18 countries. And so they said, we need e-commerce. And our team was absolutely panicking. I remember, I think nobody got any sleep for uh, three or four weeks and we got their you know, e-commerce store up and running. And it was uh, phenomenal to see the success that they had and, and, and food products that nobody thought uh, you know, would lend themselves really well online. They were yeah. selling like hotcakes, literally, right? So uh, it's, it's, and so I have been speaking with so many of our clients and so many, you know, business associates, and they all ask the same question. And it's in fact become fashionable to ask this question. How did COVID affect you? So in fact, somebody was interviewing me yesterday and they asked the same question. Probably I've answered for the 16,000th time. How did COVID affect you and how did you adapt, right? So in the sense that, you know, I, I think, you know, human beings and businesses are highly adaptable. But at the same time, I want to know from your perspective, uh, because you were relatively new in, as a company, as a business. And so did that make it easier for you? I mean, in the sense, imagine if you're a 150 year old company suddenly say, OK, we are going to go digital tomorrow. And, and how easy or difficult was you or was it for you to go from you know, a, a standard business model to a digital business model in terms of the development and just roll out. And like you said, some of the clients didn't even know that it could, it was even possible. Yeah. Yeah. I think firstly, you've got to look at the type of company that we are. So we're, we're an event technology company. So, uh, and also, as you, as you mentioned, we are relatively new. So we're, we're five years old. That meant that in terms of our day-to-day -day operations, I, for example, picked up my laptop, walked out of the office and the next day I could work from home. A traditional bank, could not do that. They, yeah. you know, so that's the comparison I make between when I say, look at the type of company we are. Mm. And then when we actually look at our technology, we're, we're really um, blessed. We've got all of our tech and dev team in London in the office there. So again, we can have those instant conversations going, okay, what do we need to change? We're not going to be doing in-person events. How do we mm. shift to virtual and hybrid? And in, in truth, a lot of that was quite straightforward because we're in a moment now and will continue to be where tech is evolving minute by minute. If we were having this conversation five years ago, I don't think we would have been able to, to flip as quickly, but we are within sort of the space of a week or two really defined our virtual and hybrid offering and we were able to roll that out to clients. The education piece on the other end of the receiving end of that, that was a bit more, clients were also, um, it, it was petrifying what they were going through. They, there was a lot of change. They, they didn't know what was coming. So it, it took really a sort of month or two for, I guess, everything to calm down, so to say. Um, people get into the, the rhythm of working from home and that this is going to be here for a little bit. And then we started to see it pick up again, going, okay, great. We are going to shift out the rest of our events calendar for 2020 to be virtual. Um, and that then saw that, that grow exponentially. Um, this surprised us all in a great way. In October 2020, so still peak pandemic, we had our third largest revenue month ever in the history of wow. the company. So yes. that, that was proof that the company could really pivot and, and shift and still be successful. Yeah, well, that's inspiring. I'm sure, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs and startups that we work with and they come to us with an idea and, you know, uh, there's so much, you know, uh, fear, right? In the mm -hmm. sense that, you know, there, there's so many success stories, obviously, but for every success story, there are thousands sort of stories of failures. So there's so much fear. And I always tell them that if you are able to pivot and it's never about the idea, it's about the execution. And that's why, you know, uh, companies need uh, senior management people like yourselves is the fact that, you know, okay, we are in a pandemic. I'm taking my laptop. I'm going, we are a events technology company. And and, and, and that's what it takes. And I, I've been saying that for, for the longest time that it's all about the people and it's all about the execution. 
you know, and, and you can have the most amazing business idea, but I've seen people falter and then they find somebody else to blame or market conditions. But I, I guess it all comes down to people, um, you know, and, and execution, which brings me to my next question. You mentioned that your tech team is based in London. Uh, how easy or difficult is it? Because uh, a lot of our clients, again, ask the same question. A lot of startups that we work with ask the same questions. We ourselves have teams across different countries and, you know, we deal with this every day. How easy or difficult did you find to attract and then retain tech talent? And is there something that you did uh, which you thought worked really well? Something that you could share with everyone? I, I would love to give you the, the nugget of information and the, the trick to it all. Um, I wasn't actually responsible for pulling together our tech team. Um, we, have, we have a world-class CTO at the helm of it. Um, mm. And he he has this attitude to to constant hunger for new tech. So mm. he sees something cool and he, he goes digging for it. And I think that, so I, I, now I'm pivoting sort of away from how do we build, how do we have the best tech team? But I think it's driven by at the top because they then attract talent to come underneath them and, and be led by this leadership. Mm. Um, but constantly when we're in meetings with him and the, the product and tech team, it's, it's what's next. They're, they're con that mm. curiosity that lives yeah. amongst them yeah. is what makes our tech consistently better. Yeah. Um, so I'm not answering your question in terms of how do we get them, but I know how we, how we retain them and what makes, what makes it truly an amazing team. Yeah. And I, I, I think, you know, if you have that culture, then attracting them becomes a lot easier as well, right? We live in the world right. where, you know, word of mouth and referrals. So we try and build most of our team through referrals and, and I, and I think you, you did answer my question really well, because, you know, that's something that uh, I have found to be the most, you know, inspiring thing as a team. You know, people talk about team culture, especially in a very volatile world, especially in a world where, you know, especially technology talent has all the options, you know. So we've had people, uh, you know, with our clients and our clients come to us and say, we need five developers. Can you help us out? And we wonder why those developers don't stay with the clients. And we've had those, uh, some of those issues in some of the teams that we've built in the past. And we just realized, like you mentioned, that, that the minute the, you know, the inspiration from the top uh, fails to sort of percolate down, uh, these things start happening. So what happens is that when some developer is building something and they don't know why they are building it, Absolutely. and a lot of organizations sort of make that mistake of the fact that, well, I mean, that's their job. They are supposed to build a platform. Why do they need to know where we are headed? But I mean, that's, that's just what's terribly wrong with that whole setup. And, and yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's so important to have the right uh, one, the right people. And secondly, that zest to learn, right? In the sense that, uh, yeah, and, and it's, you know, like, for instance, as they say, the more you know, the more you realize how little you know. And so after doing this for a lot of years, I'm practically at a state of saying I know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so and, and that makes it exciting because every morning you get up and you feel that there's so much to learn. There's so much to find yeah. out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, and yeah, so I think. Yeah. I was going to say, we made the decision uh, two or three years ago to bring the, the tech team in house. Right. And the point that you just made, they are an integral part of the team. So why wouldn't they be in the same environment living right. the same culture um, that, that they're then contributing to the same success of the company. Uh, our, our CEO and founder in the UK um, believes fundamentally in the importance of company values and right. those values actually are pinned against our company awards at the end of the year. So no right. longer are they just that put them up on the wall and we've, we've done a good job of doing that, but it's, it's linked uh, all the way throughout everyone's work and mm. they really strive for that. So it, I, Company culture for me is number one. Sure, absolutely. And so moving back to, you know, the business model, right? In the sense that you pivoted and you pivoted quite successfully. You said you had, you know, the best month ever. And that was a sign where you felt that, yes, it can happen. So, I mean, just, uh, you know, for the benefit of all the viewers and listeners, maybe if you could share a bit more about the, the business model, how do you monetize, how, how is revenue generated and, and what are the plans? Definitely. So Headbox is an ecosystem of proprietary software that, that we've built. 
and we've built it both for the host, so the supply side of the business and the demand, so our, our corporate customers. Um, and by building those proprietary products that we've recognised is needed in the events industry to streamline it and, re and remove inefficient processes, mm -hmm. we've then been able to connect the two and, and streamline that end-to-end -end booking process. And in the process, we've then monetized those various points. So um, I'll, I'll give you an example. We've built a product um, for our host side that enables hosts to go out there and reach proactive qualified inquiries. Previously, hosts were coming to us saying, we're at 85% we're at occupancy, but I would love to be getting to that 90, 95%. How do I do that? Mm -hmm. And we are that middle point connecting them with corporates. And equally mm -hmm. on the corporate side, we were receiving a number of inquiries for that, what we call tier three inquiries, that they're the mm -hmm. lowest end. Um, and we want to make those a no-touch solution from our side. So by building this product, and it's a subscription-based product that the hosts use, they're all of a sudden seeing a lovely list of inquiries come through that they can really quickly proactively respond to. And all of a sudden they're etching their occupancy back up to that sort of 90, 95%. Very interesting. So, so you said that you have uh, a host of uh, these products, the softwares, and, and yeah. are, they, are they all uh, subscription based? No. So there's a number of, of, um, of different ways that we've done the model. Uh, so on the corporate side, uh, for example, we have a SaaS product that we work with large corporations to organize their events agenda for the entire year. And that's right. my history. And that's how I know Headbox mm -hmm. uh, from when we first started. Um, and that product was designed in order to give the corporate company those efficiencies of ROI on their event spend, complete oversight and data consolidation of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and an example of that is when I was with the large media company, I oversaw 21 agencies and, and their events. There was no way that I could possibly keep track of what was being spent, where was it being spent, and actually how do we improve efficiencies on all of that? Right. And the, the Headbox platform does exactly that. Very quickly, I had complete oversight of what events there was. I had an understanding of our entire event spend throughout the year. And then we could look at, okay, in for next year's budget, where do we need to bring some efficiencies in? Um, that, that's one side on, on the, um, for the corporate side. On the host side, as I mentioned, we have, uh, we have that product um, that enables them to go out and reach um, proactive inquiries. That's a subscription-based. But then we also work on, and this brings in our, our humankind part of our um, mission, is the account management team. And that's where we're servicing really large events that they need that human touch. So that's an area where the, the, the automation and the artificial intelligence has done its job to a degree, but the mm -hmm. human has to step in. And that brings in the creative element, the negotiation element, and ultimately the event delivery. Um, and on that, we take a commission, commission percentage. Interesting. So it's, it's multi-dimensional offerings in a way. There yes. is an element of SaaS. There is an element of you know, uh, seems like a rather formidable system, rather comprehensive system for larger organizations to manage the entire sort of event and not just one event, the entire event calendar, so to speak. And, yeah. and yeah, and th th that's, that's phenomenal. So uh, how, how do you market uh, Headbox? How, have you been, uh, have you tried the conventional modes or is it more, uh, you know, relationship based, are you using content marketing? What has worked so far for you? Yeah, so um, in, in the UK, for example, where we started, there was a lot of SEO and that really needs to drive it because if you think of, of the traditional booker, mm -hmm. they will be going on to Google and typing in um, Christmas party venue London. Um, we obviously want to be front of mind with that and that's right. where our tech really pushes up with, the, with SEO as well. Right. Mm -hmm. um, on the corporate side, that's a lot more of sophisticated conversations where if we're talking large enterprise contracts, that, mm -hmm. that's not just a quick turnaround on, on that particular sale. Um, no. And that's where you actually bring in um, a sophisticated sales team to be doing that sale and be going out to the large companies. And that's exactly how my relationship with Headbox started. Right. Um, 
and starting that more formal tender and pitch process um, that you would do for one of those. So it's it's a real mix between that, bringing in the business development side. Um, LinkedIn is also a fantastic tool because the way that you can market on LinkedIn and, and, and target specific job titles. So if you think of our particular audience that we target, it's your EAs, your PAs, um, who events typically fall to them in an organization where they can't afford to have an events team. Um, but then you've also got your heads of events um, and, and event managers. Right, right. So, I mean, talking about business development and, you know, how you got started. So as the CEO of Headbox Australia, what opportunities do you see in this part of the world and what challenges do you foresee? And, and, and what do you think is the first thing you should be going after? Uh, it's a great question because it's funny when you shift to being the CEO of a company and it's your own business you want to do everything now and you want everything happening now and you want results yeah. now. It's, it's yeah. amazing how much in six months, my whole focus has shifted. Yeah. Um, what I've also learned is that you have to be really, really sharp on your focus and actually what are my priorities. Um, and so in that we're we're right now um, in our pre-launch phase, which is really exciting. Um, and we keep having moments that, that I have a, um, a phrase with my team that we celebrate the moment. So when we have a win, whether it be big or small, we recognize it and we celebrate it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, so right now we're in the, in the process of populating the entire platform with inventory. So event mm-hmm. spaces, mm-hmm. we then go into our um, launch. So when you'll actually be able to see Headbox live in Australia and it'll be active and there to use. And for that, touching back on the marketing aspect, we will be doing a full marketing campaign because mm-hmm. whilst we're very known and we have a great reputation in Europe, uh, we are new players on the block here. Um, and so we have to get our name out there and, and really make our mark. Uh, I think there are certainly challenges with COVID um, and and we're yet to get our vaccine whilst Australia has handled COVID brilliantly. um, We're still on, we're still skating on thin ice. So you Mm -hmm. you can't be too sure until we're we're in a good spot. But I think there's a huge opportunity for technology to continue to reinvent this space. Mm -hmm. Uh, We've come a long way, as I say, in five years. um, And there are, we've got competitors here, but I think competitors keep you healthy. I think if we were the only ones in this space, Mm -hmm. um, it'd be boring. I think. Absolutely. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And also, I mean, from, uh, I remember many years back, we were working with this insurance tech company and I was speaking to their CEO and he said, I said, what's the best thing that happened to your business? And he said, when our first competitor arrived and I said, why is that? And he said, because for the first three years, all we were trying to do was educate the market and educate the consumer that this can be done. And the, the, you know, the rise of the first competitor just actually validated our concept. And Absolutely. yeah, so I, I think, uh, you know, which is why I wanted to ask you as well, when you look at Australia and, you know, and this part of the world, uh, do you see uh, we are absolutely ready for it? Or do you think there is some degree of education still required in terms of the clients and how, how, much, of a, how much of a challenge uh, is that? I think to answer your first point, yes. Simple answer, we're ready for it. Uh, mm-hmm. Australia is a very forward-thinking country. Uh, it, it, it leans into tech and, it, and on the whole, it wants to be a progressive leading country. Um, and that, that's in the, the business sense. Um, I still think on a, on a day-to-day um, human-to-human interaction, you'll come up, with, uh, come up against people who don't want to embrace tech. And I actually see that as, as a great challenge because it's an education piece on why this tech isn't there to replace them in their day job because that's a fear that a lot of people get when we come in to say we're automating the inefficient processes and a, a PA will actually look at me quite petrified and think that I'm replacing her job. And it's not that at all. It's mm-hmm. to give her more efficient processes and that she can actually then come in and do effectively the fun parts of it. Um, So I think it's a balance between um, the country itself is ready for it um, and it's certainly evolving quite quickly with tech and then it's just going to be a a human to human uh, conversation. Absolutely. And so where do you see the industry evolving? And, you know, one of the questions that everyone's been asking and, you know, there are all kinds of hypotheses about this and theories about, oh, we live like this now and then life after COVID will be very different, right? So people say business travel is dead, right? So for instance, something I just don't believe in, I think, you know, people say city center living is dead. People are all trying to live in a, you know, massive house in the suburbs 
or on a farm because we are all going to be working from home. And I, I just find it a bit hard to believe. And I just feel that, you know, human beings have been migrating to these cities that have now turned into mega cities, you know, for a reason. And of course, I'm not saying that COVID is just, you know, like a slight aberration and it was just some, uh, you know, like a 10 day event or something. And yeah, yeah, of course, it's something, you know, once in three lifetime kind of events, once in a century kind of an event. So it will definitely have some lasting impact. But a lot of people keep asking from a business point of view as well, that our business is thriving now. But once things return uh, to how they were, you know, things would change. So uh, two parts to the question. One is, how do you see uh, life after COVID in the sense that do you see that it'll be even more interesting? And secondly, where do you see your business in general in five years? So in the sense that do you see new avenues opening up and new opportunities opening up? And if yes, and I'm sure the answer would be yes, which are those opportunities and avenues? Uh, I think firstly, humans are creatures of habit. We, we, we're we great at making these bold statements like the, the world is a different place and we're never going back to the old normal. In mm. many respects, we will go back to the old normal. Mm. Um, we, we love to see that face-to-face interaction, to drink at a bar with someone and to work in a bustling city. So um, and in industry and by industry will change, but I think predominantly we'll go back to that, that environment. When you look at it for our industry um, and events, I think we will go back because we'll go back to live events and people will love that and they'll love the interaction. And it's also fundamentally crucial for business. Mm -hmm. Uh, There was a report produced uh, last year, I think it was, um, that 85% of CEOs believe events are critical to the company's success. That's a a phenomenal stat. Um, But what I will preface it with is I believe the future is going to be in hybrid events Mm -hmm. so that CEOs will give their people or clients that opportunity to go, great, we're going to do this in person if you want, but okay, if you have relocated to that, that organic farm that you've so desired now that the world is so different for you, you can still dial in. Mm -hmm. So it's it's that hybrid solution that, that will be on offer. And to you, to the comment you make about business travel, um, people are so familiar with zoom now that it's really quick to jump on and have a meeting like that instead of jumping on a plane. However, I still think there is something to be said for a lot of business done face to face. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, in fact, I was speaking to, you know, some hedge fund managers the other day and I asked them the same question because, uh, you know, these guys do travel a lot and, um, and, you know, I know some of them quite well. So I was joking about what, a uh, terrible impact they have on the planet and how they are enriching our lives. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so, but I was just asking them that, Hey, you know, you always talked about, you know, having the top tier, uh, you know, airline memberships and everything and, you know, yeah. everything's first class and business class and, you know, everything's all about, Oh, this experience was marginally inferior to the last experience that I had with that airline. So I was just asking them, you know, you guys have been traveling and you just keep traveling, you know, and, and you don't really need to, do you? And, and, and funny thing that one of them said, but we never traveled for business. We never traveled to make a deal. We never traveled to uh, share any agenda. They said the only reason we used to travel was for relationships. And eventually, you know, most businesses, uh, uh, you know, are about relationships, right? So in the sense the relationship that a brand has with its customers, the relationship that, you know, let's say a services or a product based business has with, you know, its clients. And, and eventually, like you said, you know, if we are able to maintain and sustain those uh, relationships virtually, that's great. But I think there will be, you know, some element of, you know, face to face. And I hope that, and as much as I'm happy for people living on their organic farms, but it'll be nice. I don't want them getting all lonely and isolated on their uh, organic farms as well. So Zoom has taken out that, uh, that relationship building that if you're walking into a meeting room with a, with a group of people and you would have five, 10 minutes discussion on weekends or, or what yeah. have you. Um, and equally after a, a meeting, you're potentially going to go to the bar. Yes. Um, and, and some people may disagree, but there's a lot to be said for relationships building around the bar as well. Absolutely. So I think yeah. I, I'm certainly looking forward to getting back to that. 
Yeah, absolutely. I'm already doing that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, no, I mean, uh, it's, I, I absolutely agree with you. I think it's all about, you know, the relationships and people, you don't buy from companies, people buy from people. They need to understand who you are. And, and not only from a business point of view, but from a human point of view, right? In the sense that uh, I think it's so, so, so much more of a, of a richer experience uh, in the sense that once the meeting is finished, you do find out a bit more about yourself. And I try doing that, you know, with, with our teams, with our clients. And once you be done with the agenda of the meeting and say, so how are you doing? But it's not the same. Or when we sometimes do something on Zoom and we're like, okay, now everyone asks questions and chit chat with each other and everything. And there's absolute silence. Then cameras start switching off. And I'm like, oh my God, what's happening to the world? <laughs> so I hope you know, we can find that really healthy hybrid uh, that you talk about from a business point of view and also from a personal point of view and, and talking about organic farms and, you know, what the future may hold. So what's next for Ali Lord in terms of how do you see yourself working? I know, you know, you're in pre-launch stage, so you'll be uh, working like crazy over the next few months. But at the same time, do you see yourself now being more, uh, you know, location independent? Do you think you can work from anywhere? How do you see? And let's say once you've launched and everything's a huge roaring success, which I'm confident it will be, do you see yourself uh, as a digital nomad, maybe working out of Barbados? Uh, it probably won't be Barbados, but I've got to prove what, what I believe is quite a unique scenario. I'm from a um, country in Northern Queensland. Um, and so I actually have spent the past six months working from my parents' property there, which has been an amazing location to work from with, with high speed mm. internet, allowing me to do what I do. Nice. Um, as I mentioned right now, I'm in Brisbane because we're launching the Brisbane office, but 95% of the meetings that I've had this week have actually been with Sydney clients mm. and it hasn't disrupted aside from having those sort of those conversations on the relationship building, it hasn't disrupted the actual business that we're doing. Mm -hmm. So as we, as we grow uh, Headbox across Australia, and that's the, that's the ambition and the plans, I see myself as whilst head office may be in Sydney, um, I'm, I'm originally from Brisbane and Queensland, so it may be that I actually establish myself here, um, or it may be that I establish myself in Sydney. But the great thing is technology is going to enable me to be in those locations when I want to be or where I need to be, uh, which for me sets up quite an exciting future. Absolutely. I mean, uh, and they are beautiful places for those of our listeners who've not been there. I mean, you must, uh, you know, plan and travel. I, I keep a lot, uh, you know, a track of, you know, which are the most popular digital nomad destinations. There's some statistic that came out which said very soon the world will have 1 billion digital nomads. And that does not just yeah. necessarily mean that you're a copywriter or a content marketer. It could be anything, right? It, you could be running your own startup. And I think and I think COVID, as much as, you know, we all despise what's happened because of COVID, but I think it has allowed a lot of people that freedom as well. The one, you know, the kind that you're talking about, if we were living in a conventional world, you would have probably gone straight to uh, the office in Sydney or Brisbane, and that's what life would have been, and you wouldn't have had this chance. So, so uh, but interestingly, I've never heard of Australia as a digital nomad uh, destination, and I think uh, you talking about, uh, you know, Queensland and you talking about, you know, uh, the beautiful life. And I think that's something for people to consider as well. Do you have your own uh, sort of favorite uh, romanticized uh, destination in mind as a digital nomad? Or like if you want to ever take a break and work remotely, do you have a place in mind where you would want to be? I would actually, and I was there recently, uh, I would have to say Stradbroke Island, which is just off the coast of Brisbane. You, you may be familiar with it. Um, it is, for me, it's a hidden gem, probably not so hidden, um, mm. especially if I'm giving it more airtime on a podcast. <laughs> uh, but for me, it's this, it's this stunning island um, that feel, it's not very built up, um, the, the clearest water you'll get and just feels like you're, you're truly on island time when you get there. So for me, um, and you know, if I was to say what success looks like, it mm. would be having a, a house there in many years' time. We're still a startup at the moment. Um, <laughs> But having a house there that, that I can go over there and work from there and then live that digital nomad life. And then I'm, I'm shortly back in the Brisbane office or I'm on a plane to Sydney. Yeah, that sounds lovely, right? I'm, I'm already thinking, why do I need to go to the office right now? I mean, I am headed to the office. I was mentioning for a pizza party, but island living sounds a lot more appealing. So yeah. thank you so much for sharing uh, a completely new 
uh, digital nomad destination. I'm sure a lot of people will start Googling immediately. It's not Portugal. Yeah. It's not Georgia. There are a lot of other places out there as well that you can explore. And thank you so much, Ali, for doing this. And we wish you all the best. And I'm sure Headbox will be a massive success in Australia and the region. And the only thing I would say is uh, keep celebrating the moment. Thank you so much. <laughs>